All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our Creekside Bible study. Uh, let me pray us in to get us started. Father God, Lord, thank you for being such a, good, a great God, Lord. Thank you for your immense uh, wisdom that you um, you help us um, to glean on and to guide us, Lord. Thank you for your creation, how it's a witness to your um, to your magnitude, to your power, and to your glory, Lord. Thank you for your Son, His life, His resurrection, and what He did, so that we can um, we can uh, take part in the story of your gospel, Lord. I pray you would uh, give me words to <clears throat> speak truth to this group and to those out in in the universe and the um, on online, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for everything you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we are in Romans one sixteen. But let me just give a little bit of a recap of where we've been in our slow slog through Romans. We've looked at uh, Jesus being the Son of God. Excuse me. The Son of God, we looked at the resurrection, how important, important that is. We looked at how Paul, um, who is the writer of Romans, <clears throat> how he wanted to come to Rome. And he's looking forward to coming to Rome. He has not been there yet as, he, as, the, as of the writing of this book. <clears throat> and then we saw his debt to God and that we looked at his life before his salvation, before his transformation. He was Saul, who was persecuting the church and how God used his, his power, his might, and transformed that, that, um, that force he had for a force of good. And now he has a debt to God for the Jews and for the Greeks to share the gospel of the good news. So we're going to start at Romans 1, 16. So Dave, you can start us when you're ready. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. So he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He is not backing down. And Paul, he's he's been on missionary journeys before. He's dealt with persecution. He's dealt with the hardships of what it is to preach the gospel. So he knows he's going into Rome, and we'll see a little bit further down in, in uh, Romans 1 and also wrote Romans 2, the things he's going to encounter. He knows there's some sin, there's some sin, sinful behavior, some idolatry, pagan idolatry. There's, there's lots he has to deal with in Rome. And he knows what's coming up, but he is not ashamed of the gospel. He's taking all of his effort and going and going to go, go proclaim the gospel in this place. And it's for everyone who believes. Who does that include? Everyone. everyone. Can we talk a little bit more about ashamed? Sure. Um, Basically, if you're ashamed, you're not going to speak up. Um, in Matthew, it says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Um, I think it's important to, for us to realize that just as Paul Paul was everything you can imagine they did to Paul. I mean, he seriously was tortured, you know, beat up, you know, stoned, left for dead, yeah. stoned. Shipwrecks. Um, well, that not because of the gospel of God. That's not why he was shipwrecked. But no, he directly. went through a lot, but he kept sharing Jesus. And Jesus is basically saying, if you don't share me with others, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'll be ashamed of you with my father. So it doesn't matter our circumstances, who we're around, how somebody was going to react. We still talk. I mean, you might choose your words differently that it'll be that it, that it's more be receptive. But that's key. That's 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 huge because a lot of times, you know, Christians can get really timid and oh, what if they don't like what I say and whatever. So I'm just going to be quiet. You know, the society sort of told us you, you don't talk religion and politics. Look where it's brought us. Where you, it's very you know? tense talking about them now. Yeah, yeah. But no, you keep talking about it. 
So we're looking at we're going to look at a couple of things here in this verse. Um, for one, believes is an active belief, which I think we talked about this before. The idea of believing it's not simple a one-time event where you believe um, when you were a kid and that just carries you through. And I remember I was talking to a family member, this was a little while ago, and she believed her nephew was saved because he was, he, he did the whole hand-raising thing when he was a kid. <laughs> and you look at this kid's life currently, it, it, it didn't bear any fruit. That belief didn't carry through. So the belief has to be an actual belief that <clears throat> transcends time and continues throughout your life it's not a one-time event and when i call it it's getting your your get out of hell free car and you just get that and then you can live however you want and then you just cash that out when you go to heaven it doesn't work that way so let's go to mark one and it's 14 and 15 Looking at believing and the gospel of Christ. Is that one of those participle things? I can't remember. I believe it is. Which I'm not going to get into, but. Which is a, a tense of a verb. Yeah, yeah. Which implies ongoing action. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my um, grammar English isn't that great for diving that deep into that. Mine's uh, not either. So Mark 1, 14 and 15, Giovanna, you want to go ahead and read that? <clears throat> After John was put in prison, prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So believe in the gospel. And the gospel, a lot of people will say it's the death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus is alive when he's saying this. He's alive and he's telling people to repent. So yes, it does include the death, burial, and resurrection. But Jesus is alive and he's telling people to repent, which is, that's the key. Which we spent, what, three weeks on repentance um, when we're in Matthew. So repentance is key. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness of sins. You have to repent. You have to, you have to have that change of heart to be born again. Next up, we're going to Acts 24, 14. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts 20, 24, 14. I know this verse. This is the sect. Huh? Sect. And this is the verse that I use all the time when people are talking about Paul, about what he believed. Alex, when you're ready. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. A couple of things to take from this. First is, what is the way? The way is the, the two things. One, go ahead. Um, the way is the way to, to the kingdom of heaven. And it's also the name for the the sect of Judaism, which was the early church. Yeah, before they were called Christians, essentially they were called the way. And it was, yes, it was a sect of Judaism. It was considered, you had the Essenes, you had the, the Sadducees, you had the, um, I'm missing. Pharisees. Pharisees. Herodians. And the, Herodians, there was, I think, five of them. And with the way, I think it was six. But they were all, they all considered themselves to be of the same religion. It's just that the way, they followed Christ. There wasn't the division we have now where there's, Jews and non-Jews, essentially, uh, they believe this, the people of the way were, were the same. They, they shared a lot in common. They knew they did. They shared the Sabbath. They shared the commandments. They shared the, the tradition of the Jews. So they were just a sect of Judaism. One of the things I share in my Bibles and my teachings, <laughs> so many people like to divide everything up Jew and Gentile. That's the wrong division. We're going to get into that a little bit. The division of wheat and pears. Safe and unsafe, yeah. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Okay. And then believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. And like Dave was mentioning, this is this is the Apostle Paul who people say was against the law and the prophets. And he's saying, no, 
believing, he's teaching, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So Paul is not against the law and the prophets. And we're going to see that come up again and again and again as we go through Romans. Uh, so Romans chapter 4, verse 3 is next. Romans 4, verse 3. Uh, Debbie, yep, when you're ready. <clears throat> Go ahead. I'm good. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> so believe. He believed God. And Abraham is a very good example. Because we have his whole life to look at. It wasn't just a one-time belief. So it started with God calls Abraham out and tells him to leave his homeland and move to this place that's very far away. And it's not like now. Now we can, you know, you call your realtor, you know, you look out the place beforehand, you can Google it, you got your GPS, how far away is this, is this land, you have a route to get there. They didn't have that back then. He had to take his family and go out into this wilderness land. He didn't know where it was at. He had to rely on God. That was a test for him. So Abraham is a very good example. And the sages say there's Abraham went through, I think it's 10 tests, 10 separate tests to increase his faith, which we'll, again, we'll get into that in a little bit. And with each of these tests, his faith is growing. His belief is growing. And that's how he can get to the point where eventually he takes his son up to a mountain and he's going to go kill him. Now, that wasn't obviously the first test. There was there's many tests leading up to that, but God's building that up in him. And that's what same thing with our belief, our believing ought to be increasing throughout our lives. It's not a single event. We continually believe and believe and believe and get stronger in our beliefs. So what you're saying, it's not a a head thing. It's something that, that comes out of you in action. Exactly. exactly. And I, I've heard a term said that the longest distance anyone will ever travel is 18 inches. Anyone know, know what that means? From your head to your heart. Because a lot of people will understand scripture up here. They can rationalize it. They can make sense of it. But does it make does it make its way down into your heart? And that's where it starts working. And that's where it comes out in you as a, as your character, as your as your being. Because there's plenty of atheists who are very great theologians. The devil's a theologian, you know. But it has to go go beyond here and down to here. So next we get Luke nine twenty six. I think this is what you were talking about, Dave. <clears throat> talking about being ashamed. Walter, when you're ready. Okay. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory, and his fathers, and him, yeah, and in his fathers, and of the holy angels. So that's the important of importance of believing, which we've hit before. That is, if Jesus is ashamed of you, if you don't believe in him, he's not going to be, he's going to be ashamed of you when he stands in glory. In other words, you are going to the lake of fire, not a good place to be. It's interesting. I just kind of noticed a couple of the verses leading up to that. Walter, would you mind reading again, but starting at 24? Okay. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed. And when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. I think that gives it more of a life and death kind of, eternally a life and death kind of mm -hmm. context. Yeah, it puts it more in context about what he's being ashamed of and what he will be ashamed of and where that would lead. Um, looking at... Interesting. No, yeah, never mind. Go. 
looking at so for whoever is ashamed of me and my words and what are what are what are my words we're going to look at just a couple of those matthew jump to matthew 4 4 looking at jesus in his words but he answered and said you good you good no i'm good it's like i'm like matthew 4 4 it's like of course i know the scripture but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds of the mouth of god uh next day in matthew 24 but isn't that just the 10 commandments no it is not no i had that with somebody on facebook recently Matthew 24, I believe it's 35. But it's funny what you say that with the Ten Commandments, because you even look at that. The church doesn't do commandment four by by and large. It's funny we'll put this in, in the um Ten Commandments in the courthouse and everything else, and they don't do the Sabbath. That's commandment four. They like the they like the the five through ten the stealing and the coveting and everything else like that. But commandment four is always kind of left out. Mm -hmm. Well, you just moved it to Sunday, <laughs> yes, but which means not doing it essentially. No, I just basically to this person. I forget. I posted a scripture. Um, I guess it's from uh, Proverbs or Psalms where it says, uh, "If you turn your ear away from the law, even your prayer is an abomination." Mm -hmm. And somebody who's does video prophecy videos, he says, I'm pretty sure that's just referring to the Ten Commandments, but I don't want to argue about it. So yeah, it's not worth argument. But I said it gets a little dicey when you start trying to figure out what you want to believe that God said and what you don't want to believe God said. Pick it and choose it. Yep. So Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth, earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So God's word is eternal. After everything's done in Revelation, God's word will still stand. John 14. I believe it's 14, 23, and 24. Everyone there? Mm-hmm. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but my father's who sent me. This makes it very, very clear. Jesus is talking about, obviously, he speaks his father's word. So Jesus, when he when he was here. He was speaking essentially the Old Testament. There was no New Testament. The New Testament didn't come out until after the death of Jesus. Same thing when Paul told Timothy, all scripture is God breathed, although you're probably going to be going there. Not right now, but eventually. Um, and one more, just on um, my words, Psalm 89, 34. Psalm 89, 34. It's amazing how many people just don't understand that. I think I said this last week that one Jesus was a, was a Jew, but that he spoke the Old Testament. They think the I guess the New Testament had already been around, and he's just quoting from it. <laughs> I don't know how that would work. I guess I mean, he is God; he could make that happen. But still, um, yeah, it, he was speaking the Old Testament. That's all the scriptures they had. So Psalm eighty nine thirty four, my covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. And many people have taken the whole idea of covenants and said that God has broken them. And he's saying here, my covenant, I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone on my lips. So he hasn't changed anything from the dawn of time. He hasn't changed his covenants. And even there's the, everyone tries to use the Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. <clears throat> talking about a new covenant 
But you look at that covenant, look who it's to. It's to the house of Israel. And it's usually Gentiles are using this example. I'm like, look who this is to. Even if you're taking this literally, this is not to you because you're not the house of Israel. And you look at what's entailed in that, where no man is teaching his neighbor. We're not that, that place anymore because everyone knows God. Well, obviously not in that time period now. What was this verse in Psalm? Uh, 89, 34. Yeah, but plenty of people use the Jeremiah 31, 31. And it's just, I don't, I guess you have to do a lot of theological jumps to make that work. Yeah, you can't. You just, because somebody told you, and they don't go to Jeremiah, they go to the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. but, oh, but, wait. but it still says the same thing. It's the same exact thing. Yeah, you know, it's the same message. Uh, so back to Romans 1. Oops. Real quick. Yeah. You may have been there. The Bible study that we did up at Denny's or whatever in uh, Montgomery yeah. Village. Many moons ago, yeah. And Shannon came in talking about the law and everything. Mm -hmm. I, I told him, I said, I mean, I'm on the other side of arguing this. Tell him, I said, he fulfilled the law. It's over with. The new covenant replaced the old covenant. I can remember vividly saying that to him. He didn't stand up for himself as well as he should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I remember the same thing I was arguing with somebody about the Sabbath saying it, it can be every single day. I think I was using the first Corinthians is it 15, where he talks about every day. Not sure what I is mean. it? One man is is sacred to one day, but to another man, all yep. days are sacred. And I, I I argued that the Sabbath could be any day, you know, because I, I just didn't know any better. You, know you didn't I mean? know if they were talking about fasting? No, I had no idea. <laughs> no idea. But that's that's the part of sanctification is that's our lives. So we start as new believers and we grow in knowledge and grace and peace. But you, know? you can't. You've got to be Berean. You've got to be in the word for yourself. You've got to be listening to somebody who really gets it. Discipleship. Because that's yes. what the pastors from the churches that we've been going to have been teaching us. Exactly. And so you get into that mindset, and then you take scriptures and try to wrap right. it around those pillars of understanding that you have. Some of those pillars are wrong. And when you start trying to make scripture fit what your understanding is, there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. But that's the process of sanctification is learning and growing. And again, I, I've always said it. With myself, I always look back at my life, and I should look different. I should my theology should be more more bold. It should be more robust, and I should be uh, leaning more and more on God. The longer time goes on, uh, so for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone for who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. There is not a separate salvation for the Jews and a separate salvation for the Greeks. It's for everybody. There was, I don't know their names. Um, I think this was maybe like a hundred years ago. There was a rabbi who essentially got together with like a, a big head of the Christian church. And they kind of get together and they 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 tried to make this, I won't call it a doctrine. They 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 were pushing the idea that the rabbi wanted the idea that we're saved different than you guys. Because he didn't want the Gentiles proselytizing. He didn't want them giving the gospel to the Jews. So they kind of made this loose agreement that, hey, the Jews are saved this way, the Gentiles are saved this way. But that is not in scripture. We see here for the Jews first and also for the Greek. It's it's say the same salvation, the same faith for, for everybody. And the distinction, like Dave was talking about earlier, which we'll get into again and again and again, the distinction isn't Jew and Gentile, Jew and Greek. It's saved and unsaved. Those are the only two people groups that God really divides up there is no other division of people so next we're going to go to verse 17 i think dave you're up where i'm sorry where are we at uh romans back of romans Romans 1 17 um for it in excuse me for in it the righteousness of god is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith from faith to faith, kind of going back to Abraham, it's this idea of your faith growing, increasing. It's a propagating faith, as we again, as we've seen in Abraham with the test. And as, as his life goes on, his faith grows stronger. And the just shall live by faith. 
Uh, that is, let's going to go to, we're going to go to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, however you pronounce it. <laughs> Habakkuk 2 4. Habakkuk, yeah. Habakkuk. There you go. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. There's about 30 different pronunciations for his name. Yeah, this, I wasn't around to talk to him. He was a couple of generations before me. Just a couple? <laughs> Back at 2 4. I want to see something in this place. You get it, Alex? Yeah. Gio, when you're ready. Four. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but he just shall live by his faith. But the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? And what does it mean to be just? Sort of. Saved or believe you a believer? Righteous, yeah, which is close enough. As, yeah, close. Just to be righteous. Justified. Justified. Uh, so let's next go to Galatians 3. Ten through twelve. Looking at being saved by faith. And a little deeper dive into salvation itself. Galatians 3, 10 through 12. I'll take these. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now hearing this, can you get the idea of we're not saved by the law by hearing that? Because this is, this is Paul speaking. And mm -hmm. if you take this apart and you, you clip it, you can make that essentially your truth. You know what I mean? If you're taking it out of, out of context. Well, you're not saved by the law. No, you're not. Saved you're saved by faith. But if, for instance, if you were to say, for many are as, all, no, sorry, for as many as are the works of the law are under the curse. And many people will say, oh, this is the, 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 the law is a curse, which yes, it is. And in going down, curse it is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And then there's, but no one is justified by the law, and they'll use that. So you can, you can take this, and this is what a lot of theologians, a lot of churches do. They'll take snippets of scripture and make their doctrine fit that. <laughs> and Paul isn't really saying that. Paul isn't saying that. Let's throw out the law. When he says, no one is justified by the law, he's true in this sight of God is evident, because for the just shall live by faith. Faith comes first. First. And then when you get the faith, you're changed, you're born again, and then you have a love and a desire for the law. A lot of people will say we're not supposed to go back under the curse of the law. And actually, Galatians 4 is even more, that's what, the one we were talking about recently, a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. That's actually even more, people twist that even further. But you can see here, this is, again, this is Paul. How it can you can easily take this out of context and make Paul say something he did not say at all. As Peter said, Paul can be hard to understand, and unwise men twist his words for their own to their own destruction. Uh, next up is Hebrews, I think 10. Hebrews 10, 36 through 39. Sorry, 10 what? 10, 36 through 39. I think I've been here before. Looks familiar. 
I've got a lot of marks on it. Yeah, we may have. We'll just read it real quick. Uh, I think, Gio, you're next, or is it Alex? For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the, now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And this is where Paul, like you mentioned, Dave, where he's, he's citing Habakkuk in verse 38. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What does it mean to draw back to perdition? What does that mean? What's perdition? Okay, we just talked about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was last week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, so I'm, it, I'm staying hell? quiet. Is it, <laughs> hmm? is it hell? Yeah, like fire hell. Yep, pretty much. So what does it mean to draw back to perdition? To go back to your simple, simple way? Exactly. To renounce your faith, to... Um, you know, he's he's talking about endurance. So again, you're talking about that whole part, a simple thing about continuing action mm -hmm. that you can draw back and it can lead you to the lake of fire. And that's like not renounce, that you can renounce God or not stand up for God or lose your faith in him. And you can also take this to not following what he tells us to do when you love him. All right. Um, back to Romans. Mm -hmm. Let me get into the part most known about Romans 1, 18 through 32. And we mentioned last week, I think towards the end, this is almost like a, a pattern of, of destruction, if you will, for a nation or even for, for a person or for people, people group. Looking at the wrath of God, Debbie, when you're ready, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Who wants the wrath of God? Not <laughs> the wrath of God is not a good thing, obviously. What is it? What period of time? When does it come out? What is the wrath of God? Judgment. Oh. Huh? Judgment. Judgment. It's happened before. When it has, has it happened before. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's one example. There's another bigger example. Sorry. There you go. Yep. The entire world was judged, and eight people survived. And there's estimates. There's estimates of the how many people were living at that time? And it's in the millions, if not billions. And you think eight people survived? That's just an astronomical number to imagine that much death happening. And that's, that's God's wrath. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. The reason I, I throw that out, that question out, mm -hmm. is a lot of people, when they look at tribulation, they'll divide up into tribulation and like there are people that are pre-wrath. Like the wrath doesn't start until this point in tribulation. And they try to break things down in different ways. And you can't. All of tribulation is wrath, is judgment. And that's actually the key word that you use, judgment. Yeah, we don't want to go there. Yeah, wrath is not good. John 3.36. Looking at God's wrath. Who's up next, Todd? Uh, Walter? Romans 3.30. No, not Romans. John 3.36.
He who, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. What does abide mean? It lives with? Yes. So the wrath of God lives on you. And uh, how long is everlasting life? Forever. Everlasting. <laughs> yes, everlasting. <laughs> not, not really. Because if you look at the Seventh Day of Venice, they believe that they put it in people in two categories: you you have Jesus and you go to heaven, or your soul is destroyed. There is no everlasting punishment; you just cease to exist, which is nice in a way. At least you're not rolling around a lake of fire <laughs> for eternity. <laughs> I guess that's better. Um, but yes, we are all eternal. Period, and that's the reason we have so much such an issue with death you look at a funeral or when someone dies i mean it's very very hard for humans to grip with death it was not in, originally intended for to be a part of creation at all um but it is and that's why we have a, such a, a hard time with it because we just we don't know what to do with it we know we're immortal like deep down we know we're immortal beings but it's like we see death and it just it doesn't make sense it's very very tough tough for us to grasp we'll just assume they're all everyone's going to the same place yeah god wouldn't do that yeah there's another angel in heaven or there's many other sayings people people do and i think it's got to be very very hard to do a funeral as a pastor mm -hmm. for someone you know is not saved that's got to be tough and especially if you if the people why it's well yeah if you're not willing to tell the truth yes you have to lie you can't you know, they do. Plenty of them do. They'll do exactly what Debbie said. They, they just act like they don't know, or they just, yeah, assume this person is saved, but they're not. Yeah. But like I said, uh, the same thing is hard. You know, years ago, I went to visit someone, but uh, she killed herself with that knowledge. But there was no village. And in the funeral, you know, the priest, he said, well, she's going to the lake of fire because she committed suicide, and that's against it. And even myself, I was like, how can he speak like that? I, like you said, it's hard. Yeah, it's uh, very hard to grasp. Took a shame to the whole family because what happened, they would say, you know, it's going to be bring bad things to bad things to the village. So tell the truth, like you said, tell the truth or lie. It's, hard. it's much easier to, to lie. And you see this with any time a celebrity dies. I remember it was at, um, uh, what's the basketball player who died? Kobe. Like weeks after, they're showing all the great works he did. And no one talks about all the bad stuff he did. And every celebrity that happens with, they show all the, they, they're digging through their through their old work, finding all the good stuff they did, but not talking about their actual their soul, the state of their soul. I had a friend, tree climber, who passed away, got electrocuted doing tree work. Not with me, but um, he openly, there is no God. How could there be a God if, you know, babies are die of this? There can't be a God. And he, I mean, livid about it. I went to his funeral. It was a Catholic funeral. And the priest is up there, like, talking about how he was dedicated to God as a baby and that God's going to receive him because of that. Just like, excuse me, that's not biblical. I wanted, I mean, I wanted to say something. Like, it's, it's hard. It's, it's very tough. Uh, Ephesians 5 we're going to be on the wrath of God for a little bit Ephesians 5 1 through 7 oops I'm in the wrong book Ephesians 5 and I'll walk through this one everyone there no. Yep. Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. What does it mean to be an imitator? It means to copy, to do the same thing. And I think there's another scripture we're going to get into a little bit later. 
but we're be, to be imitators of God to do the same thing. And I find it funny after going through the messianic route and understanding things. People tell us, the church tells, tells us to be like Christ, to imitate Christ. I think Paul says, um, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So they want us to imitate Christ, but what did Christ do when he when he walked the earth? He obeyed the commandments. He did the Sabbath. Did they want us doing those things? The church, by and large, church. No. You know what? Even though he believed in Christ, he still went to synagogue. Who, Paul? Yes. No, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> The same thing with Paul. I mean, they they went to synagogue. They yeah. didn't. They didn't go out and start something new. No, but it's it's funny with that. They want you to be like Christ, but don't be like Christ. They don't be too much like Christ. Just be enough like Christ. I don't know how that works out. Children. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's it's. it's, it's all all I know. <laughs> Dave's eating treats, by the way. So put that on your list, Donna. Um, continuing on. Thank you. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. That was when I was teaching. Doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> See, that's a, you have to be able to ignore all this stuff going on. You can't do it. It's too much noise. I know. I've okay. done it. <laughs> and giving himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet, so, yeah, sweet smelling aroma, but fornication and all uncleanness. Or covetousness. What's uncleanness? They gave it away. <laughs> Unclean foods or covetousness. What is covetousness? Oh, Taking just right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Taking something someone else has <laughs> and desiring it. Um, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. And we looked at saints. Uh, last week, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, excuse me, <clears throat> but rather giving of thanks. For this, you know, there is that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And there are plenty of these lists. There's Ephesians, this is, I think, Ephesians 5. There is uh, 1 Corinthians 6. I think 9 through 12, Revelation 20. There are essentially these, what I call the list. And these are things that will keep you out of heaven. And number one always is sexual immorality. That's always the top of the list, um, which we'll get into in Romans in a little bit. Um, but looking at um, who are the wrath of the wrath of God comes on the, uh, the sons of disobedience. Um, let's go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, is this 1 through 11? Yes, okay. Colossians 3, yeah, 1 through 11. Everyone there? Dave? Um, give me a second. Goodness. I have the then crossed out and it's replaced and, it, and even the F and instead of if then it should be since. So I since you were... something about it being homesick but anyhow since you were raised with christ seek those things which are above where christ is seated at the right hand of god set your mind on things not of on excuse me set your things set your mind on things above not on things of the earth for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, excuse me, when Christ, who is our life, appears, then 
you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these, all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who, is, who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, a circumcised or an uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, nor free, but Christ is all and in all. This is a, a summation of every, pretty much everything we just talked about. So set your minds on things above. It means don't worry too much about what's going on here on earth. For you died. How did you die? How did we die? Sin. That's what caused our death. We we died when we to the ways of this world when we've accepted Christ. Exactly. We've accepted Christ and Christ came in him. We're living anew. Yeah. And that's the whole yeah. thing with the baptism and buried and resurrected and being and in, talked about in order to to be born again you have to die you have to die in order to be born again and your life is hidden in christ when christ now life appears therefore put your members what are your members not church members <laughs> kill off the church members ain't doing good <laughs> sounds like a good idea sometimes <laughs> members are just parts of your body I know how Pastor Joey used to always say, and I like, like the way he put it, it's like the flesh. He said, if I could just get rid of this flesh and rip it off, I would. Yeah, yeah. I used to say that when I was a younger, younger believer also. If I could just get rid of this body and get a new one, that would be much, much better. Um, but put to death your members. It, it, he's not talking literally. And because if you go back to the, was it Jesus and Matthew, um, pull out your eye. And what was it? Pull out your eye and... Um, Pluck out your eye. Pluck out your eye. If one eye cause, if your eyes cause you to see, it's better to pluck it out and go into heaven blind. And if you cut your right hand off, yeah, yeah, it'd be better going without without a piece of your body than not going. Exactly. Which he's not talking about literal mutilation. He's not talking about taking a pain and those things are causing you to sin. Yeah. Um. So wait a minute. You mean when we got baptized, all of our sins, past, present, and future, weren't nailed to the cross? We don't have to worry about sin anymore. No. <laughs> There's a whole process behind that. But that's what they teach in church. So. I, I know, I know. <laughs> um, so put your members, um, which are fornication, blah, 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 on these things. But you yourselves um, put off. So you ought to change. You ought to be different. You, you take these sins and you put them behind you. You need to be, it's almost like having a list of things you need to conquer. That's what it really should be. You're aiming to be more righteous. So that's taking these things and and basically nailing them to the cross then to a cross and do not lie to one of those you have put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man the same idea there ought to be old and new you ought to be different where there is neither greek nor jew circumcised nor uncircumcised barbarian scythian slave nor free christ is all in and all Again, there's no distinction between Greek or Jew. There's only one distinction, saved and unsaved, period. End of story. Revelation 14. <clears throat> I like the, when I use the analogy of wheat and tares, because anybody that knows that parable knows that the tares get gathered up and thrown in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14, 9 through 12. I'll take this. And a third. Oh, wait. Baby's not there yet. 
Where were we at last time? I didn't write it down. Colossians 3, 1 through 11. So Revelation 14, 9 through 12. Then, and then we're, see, we're, right now we're in the middle of the actual wrath of God happening in Revelation. It's currently taking place as where we're at in scripture. Revelation uh, 14, 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the lamb of the lamb. And the smoke of their tent torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and faith of Yeshua. So again, we're in the middle at this point in time, in the middle of Revelation and the wrath of God is currently happening. God does not pour out his unbridled. Who are the saints? Hold on. Where are the you patience of the saints. You just read it in verse 12. Who are they? What do they do? Verse 12. Yeah, but hold on. Hold on. We're going to get there in a second. All right. Who is, um, who does God pour out his wrath to? Unbelievers. Ungodly people who have not, who do not have the Holy Spirit. Um, although we've heard the word twice, the wording twice already, mm -hmm. um, the godless. Yep, the sons of di disobedience or the sons godless. Of disobedience. Yep, that's it. those are the people who God um, puts under His wrath, and we see a couple examples. We've seen two examples so far. Walter, you mentioned both of them of God's judgment. One being the flood. Now, obviously, not all of what mankind was wiped out. There are eight people who who survived. And those are people who were righteous. And we've seen the same thing in Saddam and Gomorrah. And Abraham was bargaining with God, saying, hey, God, is there 50 people? If there's 50 people, 50 righteous people, don't destroy the city. And God, Abraham's like, wait a minute, okay, there's not, there's not 50, 45, 30, 20, 10? And I think he gets down to five. And he, he start, I guess Abraham, it dawns on him, there's not many righteous people in this place. So God does not pour out his unbridled wrath on his children. And that's why he got Lot and his wife and his daughters out of there. Same thing with the flood. He did not pour out the flood on, he pulled out, poured out on the earth, but Noah and his children escaped in the flood. Same thing in Revelation. And this gives weight to the, the idea that the rapture is part of, is a biblical idea. Because this wrath that's being poured out in Revelation is worldwide. I mean, there's this crazy stuff happening, boils and death and famine. And there's just, it's, it's, I used to believe when I was a newer believer, I used to love reading Revelation because I'm such a visual person and there's so much here. I used to think, man, this is going to be cool to watch. The more and more I understood, I'm like, no, it's not going to be cool to watch, at least not from earth, <laughs> maybe from my wedding chamber up in heaven. But um, yeah, it's, it's going, it's literal hell on earth. It's just crazy to, to, to fathom what's going on. Um, but we see a paradigm or a difference in the patience of the saints who are to keep, to keep the commandments of God. That's what the saints do in the faith of Jesus. So the believers, this is what they do. This is what they, they should be doing all the time. In current day, not just here in Revelation, because this is probably a point in time where the, the church has been raptured. In order, in order to get saved now, it's going to be much, much harder. But these people here, are, these saints are keeping the commandments of God. We ought to be doing the same thing currently. Now, if God was serious about it, he'd say it twice, right? Go back to Revelation 12, verse 17. Read that. 12, 17? Mm -hmm. All right, let me wait for her. And the warrior and the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you only have the testimony of Jesus Christ, he ain't worried about you.
Let me wait one minute. Seventeen. All right. Let's see. If we're staying. We're gonna stay in Revelation. I believe it's seventeen. Same chapter. Yep. Same chapter. Fourteen. 17, 17 through twenty. My notes were a little screwed up. You said same chapter, but we were in 14 earlier, right? Yep. Okay, so, so 14, 14, 14, yep, 17 through 17 20. Through 20. Then an, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's a lot of blood. So does everyone know what a horse's bridle is? Mm -hmm. that's the thing on, the, on their face essentially and horses are tall i mean i can stand next to a horse and most of them they're, they're uh, six five six feet tall 1600 furlongs is 184 miles it's the length of modern day israel yeah just imagine that entirely filled with blood six feet for 184 miles that's a lot of death and that's god's wrath being poured out Armageddon. Yep. How many miles did you say it was? 184. And I've heard it's been a while since I, I remember this. Because I used to I used to do a lot of revelation. And there was a, I think it was a mathematician or some kind of teacher. He did the estimate of the amount of people that they needed to die per day to match kind of what's going on in Revelation. There are so many people dying that there literally is not enough manpower to bury them. Even if you, if that's the only thing you were doing was just burying people, there's literally not enough labor to bury that many people dying that fast. It is just, again, it's hell on earth. It takes what seven years to bury them? Something like that. It's it's just it's unreal. Uh, Revelation 15, verse one. Then I saw another angel, another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them was the wrath of God complete. And then lastly, Revelation 16. Verses 1 and 2. What was the verse in 15? Uh, this verse 1. 16, 1 and 2? Yep, 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to, to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sores came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So obviously it's not a good idea to take the mark. Um, I won't get into the details of the arc of the mark. Um, many people have ideas about it. Is it a chip? Is it physical? Was it not physical? COVID. It wasn't COVID. Yeah, people have tried to surmise what the mark means for many, many years. And one, I think you've mentioned this, and I've heard other people say, and one thing is it's on your your right hand and your on your forehead, which do symbolize your hands are your works and your your forehead is your mind. So there, there's that aspect to it. But also, there is there's got to be some physical component to it because you can't buy or sell without it. It's the Shema. Yeah, you bind the law to your hand and, and your forehead, um, and that's why he's the man of lawlessness. It's connected to it's connected to Torah, which we'll get into in a little bit later. But there that does have to be a physical aspect because again, you can't buy or sell without it, and that's why most people say it's the chip because there's they're moving. I know getting off topic just for a split second china has its social credits 
and they're 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 pushing things like that. we can see some of this stuff coming along um but i don't want to spend too much time on that let's jump back into actually they're testing coming up very shortly they're doing a 12-week test in this country for digital currency oh yeah i did hear about that we're going back to romans one by the way go ahead yeah no that it is coming there will be a digital currency, a digital whatever, and the chip and everything, and the lawlessness is going to be tied into it. Yep. So Romans 1, we are now at... For the wrath of God is revealed to from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Not just like 90% or 80%. But all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So we're going to look at ungodliness. Romans, is that eleven twenty-five? Hold on a second. Let me make sure that's right. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant. There's a lot of context behind this. Um, yeah, let's let's move beyond this one. Um, go to Titus 2. We'll eventually be here anyways in due time because this is in Romans. There's a bit, a bit of context to cover with that verse. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Okay. Dang. That's it. <laughs> no for that. <laughs> Man. It passes so fast. I know. Ah, all right. Titus 2, um, 11 and 12. I don't know who's up for reading. I think Giovanna's, you're up. If I remember correctly. Yeah. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Ungodliness and worldly lust, which are opposite of living, living, living soberly, righteously, and godly. So you could sum up ungodliness as basically lawlessness. That's really what it really is. You're ungodly. You do not want God. That was what two verses? What was the verses in Titus? Uh, 2, 11, and 12. Thank you. Next, we're going to go to Jude. Mm -hmm. Yep, Jude. A book not very often quoted. Not quoted. Not often cited. Right before Revelation. Yep. Jude 1. Jude two, actually, you don't get the, you didn't get the new Bible. <laughs> yeah, Jude only has one. Yeah, Jude two. <laughs> Jude only has one chapter. Uh, Fourteen and fifteen. And I'll take this one. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude has a lot to say about being ungodly. This is in, what, two sentences? So he's executing judgment on all of the ungodly men. Um, let me see. Next up is 1 John 2, 6. Oh, what's going on? 1 John 2, verse 6. Uh, 
Yeah, let's take it back. Let's get some context. Let's jump back up to three. First John two, take it three through six. And I'll read this through this one. Now, by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But ever, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who abides in him uh, himself to walk just as he walked. So ungodliness is the opposite of um, keeping the Torah. And keeping the Torah is keeping Christ's commandment. So we ought to walk as he walked. Um, one more, 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 1. Where are we going? 1 Corinthians 11. Oh, we're not going to get out of this. Man, we're going to be here for a while. Shoot. <laughs> it's not going to be a clean break. Uh, all right. Actually, we'll, we'll stop here. This would be a good place to stop. I know the struggles. <laughs> I get it. You try to have a nice clean break so you, you don't break up your your thread. Um, this is going to be as close as I can get. So first, Corinth, this is easy. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. 11. 11.1. Which I talked about this earlier. This is it's pretty simple stuff. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. We ought to walk as Christ walked. There is no 90% no Jesus or 50% Jesus. We do what he did. He obeyed the commandments. He honored the Sabbath. You know, he um he wanted to uh, he wanted to honor God, or he did honor God in everything he did. So he, he followed Torah. That's what we also ought to do is follow Torah. There is no abolishment of the Torah. Um, Jesus did not abolish it. <clears throat> he gave no command to do it, and he lived it. And again, if we're going to imitate him, imitate Paul as he also imitates Christ, that means to do what he did. Plain and simple. Don't make it complicated. Well. If you're living in ungodliness, you're not living by the Torah. It's the complete, opposite. Complete opposite. Complete because opposite. Lawlessness and righteousness are opposites. You can't be in both. Exactly. And with that, we're going to close. We'll pick up next time in the unrighteousness and verses and 18. Um, so let me... First, making notes. But you're going to get all that in righteousness. Say Romans one eighteen. I mean, one. We're in the middle of one eighteen. Yeah, the middle. Stopping. So we'll we'll pick back up in the middle and unrighteousness, as we did ungodliness first, and we'll do unrighteousness. So let me pray us out. And Pamela is just now joining us a little late. <laughs> hey, Pamela, we're uh, we're actually wrapping up. Um, let me close this out in prayer. Father God, Lord, thank you for, for being such a great life. Great God, Lord. Thank you for your word and just how we can just spend time in it, dwell on it. Thank you for um, brothers and sisters who, who can um, help us sharpen each other, Lord. Thank you for those brothers who do tell us, brothers and sisters who tell us the tough things that we need to hear to straighten us up, to get us on the, the right path. Um, thank you for Brother Wayne for being such a, a help with us and getting us to understand just the, the deeper meanings of some of the Hebrew that we just, the church at large has ignored, Lord, so that we can have a full understanding of you, of your son, of your word, what you want from us and your will, Lord. We thank you and praise you for everything you do in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hi, Pamela. Let me stop recording. Hold on.